question. And thank, you, thank you all for coming. And like in the name of our institute, I'm very uh, honored for us to have in this uh, event here. So thank you very much, much Marcia and the and Human Society. So what I'm going to try to show to you in the next 30 minutes will be uh, what we, we are using the ITSLs cells and especially the organoids, some uh, new insights about the biology of the Zika virus. Before I started with the, 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 the presentation of the Zika virus, I'd just like to thank the uh, people from my from the group that are here, that are participating in the, in the work that I'm going to show to you, and also to our uh, collaborators from, from Brazil, and also from Chile and, uh, and Argentina. And uh, these are some our sponsors, so I'm also very thankful to all of them, for all of the support that I have in the lab from these uh, agencies and funding agencies and, and, and companies as well. So, uh, and, um, Marina Red gave an awesome uh, introduction about the IPS, so I'm going to be very fast about the, 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 what the kind of work that we're doing here, but we're basically working with IPS cells, and uh, we, uh, besides using the uh, fibroblasts from the skin of uh, human patients, we are also isolating the IPS cells from the uh, urine. It's a very, uh, easy and, and interesting technique because we, we can also work with like uh, children and, uh, and elder people using this kind of uh, uh, approach to isolate the uh, epithelial cells from the urine and then make IPS cells from them. So uh, we have uh, different cell lines and we are basically focused on study uh, mental and neurological disorders. So we have a bank here in the institute and uh, we of course we are very happy to share some of the cell lines that we have here with uh, other folks interested in the work with the same kind of uh, diseases. I'm just going to do a very brief overview about what we are doing here in the Institute besides the work with the Zika virus. Uh, a few years ago, we, we showed some uh, interesting data regarding uh, schizophrenia using IPS cells. We showed that there is an increase in the levels of reactive oxygen species on those cells, and then that also we are able to revert this uh, Increase in the increase in the reactive oxygen species, and also in some uh, elements such as zinc and potassium, using the cells, and in this case using valproate. This paper was then acknowledged here. This is a very interesting uh, review from uh, Nissim Bevinisti, showing uh, some of our works here in his list of uh, uh, disease modeling using uh, IPS cells. So. And uh, working with the uh, organoids, we also uh, started to work, organize a few years ago, I mean, after uh, Lancaster started to do that. And then uh, we are also playing with some interesting things, we do some tomography in this, in this organoids, and it's very interesting what we can see from that. Just a uh, very interesting picture, this is like a video, so this is what I'd like to share with you. But uh, basically what we are showing here is, uh, this is another paper in which we show changes in the trace elements depending on the stage of differentiation of these organoids. What's interesting when you think about the work with uh, nutrition during uh, early stages of development, this could be useful to know that like you have changes in the levels of these trace elements depending on the stage of differentiation of these brain organoids. And uh, one other thing that we are very interested in the lab is to try to fill uh, the lack of uh, uh, models and also of studies in, uh, in psychiatry. There is a, a long period without new, without the, the discovery without, of new drugs used in psychiatry. So uh, we decided to start working with uh, what is, has been called the uh, psychedelic renaissance. That's the use of uh, psychedelics as a new approach to deal with uh, psychiatric diseases and depression and other diseases. And then in, in, the, in the northeast of Brazil, there's a very interesting group in the uh, Federal University of uh, uh, Rio Grande do Norte, in which they are using uh, ayahuasca. That's uh, uh, it's a uh, some kind of a drink that's used in religions in the uh, in, in Brazil, and it is rich in, uh, in uh, one compound that's called DMT, dimethyltryptamine. That's associated. With, it's a psychedelic, but uh, they are showing that like it has a very interesting uh, effect in the in depression. Then we decided to use the, the to, to, to identify the compounds that are present that are present present in the uh, ayahuasca to see what happened when we add these compounds to IPS cells uh, differentiated as neuro cells or also and also in the in the brain organoids. So uh, we, we first showed that like our mind 
that one of these compounds pre present in the ayahuasca is able to increase, increase the uh, neurogenesis or to increase the number of nerve stem cells in the, in the, in the model. It's interesting how many people uh, look at, at this paper, almost 300 views, 300,000 views. So it's interesting that people are very uh, interested in the psychedelics. <laughs> And uh, besides the army, the, the interesting thing here is that our mind was visually assumed that it was some kind of, it was an inhibitor of the monamine oxidase. And the DMT to reach the brain, you have to be inhibited. I mean, it can't be destroyed by the monamine oxidase. So this was the main uh, role, uh, believed it, for the our mind. And we showed that like, in this case, our mind is blocking the adrenal uh, 1A uh, kinase, which is also associated with Alzheimer's disease and other uh, disease of the brain. So it's interesting that this could be, uh, uh, maybe this is why you have this link with depression. Because like you know that like depression is associated with a decrease in neurogenesis and like some uh, antidepressant uh, uh, drugs, it's, uh, it's known to increase neurogenesis. So this is maybe another role for the our mind besides uh, blocking the, 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 the degradation of DMT before it reaches the brain. But we also worked with the uh, DMT. And first we showed that like the organoids, the brain organoids, they have the receptors for the DMT. I mean the serotonin receptors and also the sigma one receptor. And then uh, in collaboration with uh, Julian Minardi, who is here, and with Daniel Martins from New York County, we, uh, we did uh, uh, proteomics of basically of the, uh, all of the proteins that were changed after the, uh, the organoids were exposed to DMT. And uh, we found in almost 1,000 proteins that are changed after 24 four hours of uh, treatment with DMT. And the majority of them, I won't have time to, to, to talk about it now, but majority of them are associated with learning, plasticity, which is very interesting also when you think about uh, the effects that happen in the so basically, in here in the institute, we work with uh, human patients and with uh, IPS cells uh, differentiated as neurons or uh, astrocytes and uh, organoids. And uh, now I'm going to present to you the same kind of approach that we used uh, on the uh, previous work that I showed here to uh, deal with the Zika virus. Or in other words, how the IPS cells can help to understand the global health security threat. So uh, for the ones that don't know, uh, Zika virus, it's a blood flavivirus that uh, has as a host, the main host is primates, uh, primates, and the vector is the Aedes aegypti, that's a mosquito. It's close to the to other uh, viruses that are also here in Brazil. Fortunately, due to the spirit of the year, the, 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 the amount of cases is very low, so people don't be so scared. It's much uh, calm now than the, in the summer. So we have the Zika virus that's close to this dengue virus, and it's important for the one of the experiments that I'm going to show to you. So uh, for the ones also that don't know, it started in uh, one forest called Zika in Uganda. This is why the name is Zika virus. And uh, since 1947 until 2007, it was considered like a mild disease, like uh, transmitted by mosquito. One in every five uh, people uh, got uh, sick, get sick. The symptoms like takes from two to seven days, no, no, no treatment, but really no big uh, issue like fever, rash, and some joy, pain, pain. So basically that. But after it arrived in, in, in Brazil and then spread to other countries, uh, and uh, after this uh, uh, last outbreak, all, all we know what happened. This is a paper that was published recently, uh, including some folks from our institute showing the evolution of the Zika virus and how it spread in the Americas. And uh, we know that like, when it arrived in, in Brazil, it was uh, very scary. People don't know exactly what was going on. And uh, here, in the, in the, it was associated the Zika virus with the microcephaly, right? So just to show to you the increase in the number of uh, cases of uh, microcephaly happening in Brazil, uh, while we are also having the increase in the number of uh, people infected with the Zika virus, right? So we have almost 200,000 cases of Zika in Brazil, 11,000 cases of pregnant women, uh, of uh, pregnant women infected with the Zika, and then they increased the number of almost 3,000 cases of microcephaly. Okay, what has happened here is that in the, the other side of the street, we have our uh, neuroimaging center, in which we were receiving some of the cases of the microcephaly. 
So we have like Fernando do Palmol and other folks here from the Institute study using your imaging, the, the, this, this uh, babies, these children, these fetus. And one thing that caught our attention is that we have all of these cases of what we call these calcifications that's associated with like a, a hot in the in the in the stop in the in the neurogenesis. So something like would be really associated with the phenomenon of neurogenesis in the brain of this uh, of this uh, babies. And uh, also working with in, in collaboration with uh, Leila Shimeli, uh, we also show that like if you have the, the virus infecting these different parts of the of the human brain tissue. But uh, these papers are published, right? This is the first one. This is the second one. But we still, it was not clear to us uh, how would be the infection, if the how would be the what, what would be the consequence of the infection for the for the uh, human brain tissue. And this is why we decided to work with the, the, the kind of models that we are running in the lab, including the nerves themselves, the astrocytes, the neurospheres, and also the brain organoids, to try to understand this connection between the infection of the Zika virus and the consequences for the development of the brain. So what I'm going to show to you in the next minutes will be uh, the consequence of the Zika infection during neurogenesis and growth of human neurospheres and the brain organoids, and some insights about the molecular mechanisms associated with this infection, and uh, a platform that is developed here in the lab to try to deal and try to try to anticipate some of the consequences and also to do drug screening for uh, some other kinds of uh, malfor malformations that can be observed in the in the, in the brain caused by other virus and other other uh, agents. So, starting with the nerve stem cells, we started this project like in the, I remember very well because Carnival is something very huge in Brazil, and we started it in the uh, Saturday of Carnival of last year. And uh, we got the, the virus from a, from a colleague that's called Amil Pertanuri, who is a, uh, 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 a professor that's working with uh, Zika and another virus for a long, long time. Then we got the virus with him in the University of Rio de Janeiro, and then we infected these nerves themselves with the virus. And the first thing that we saw was that, uh, yes, these uh, nerves themselves, these human nerves themselves, derived from IPS cells, they are able to be infected. And uh, here we see in the red, the, uh, an antibody that's uh, staining the virus, the Zika virus, and in blue, you have the nuclei of the cells. And we show that like these cells, they, they are able to, the nerve stem cell, the, the virus is able to, to replicate inside these nerve stem cells. But uh, since we know that like the, the, there's something more than just killing the cells, we'd, we'd be interested to see what would happen in, the, in terms of the morphology of the, like the, these uh, spheroids or the, of the aggregates, or in, the, in this case, the human nerve stems, the, the nerve spheres, and then in the brain organoids. So in the case of the of nerve spheres, in A, you're seeing uh, one uh, healthy neurosphere without the Zika, and then in B, one neurosphere with the Zika three days or four days after the infection. And then after seven days, basically, they will have no more uh, neurospheres there. So this is uh, in the, with the neurospheres forming in the, in the plate without the virus. This is with the virus, okay? And then we look in the... Uh, in the, in the inside the cells, in this case here, you're seeing the, the actual the, the, the brain of the human brain tissue of a fetus, okay? And then we compare with what we found in the in the, in the human uh, neurospheres, you basically see the, the same kind of uh, infection and the same kind of uh, deformation, the morphology of the, of the cells and, the, and the, how the, the virus, they, they, they are uh, inside the cell. One of the things that called our attention, looking to the to the brains, of the actual brains of the of the fetus and of the babies, is that besides the calcification, we have changes in the migration, that probably associated with the changes in the migration in this in this tissue. And then we decided to go and to look in the in the brain organoids because in that case we have like the interkinetic nuclear migration, we have the formation of the cortical plate, and several other aspects of the brain development we can replicate in this kind of model. Just, just to show again, this is another tomography of the one of these brain organoids. Okay, and then we, what we, we did, we got this uh, brain organoid, we infected them with the Zika virus, and then uh, we started to, to uh, follow the growth of these brain organoids for uh, over uh, 11 days. And this is the growth that we see in the, in the uh, control organoids, and this is how they grow in the presence of the Zika virus. So they are not completely destroyed, as we saw with the neurospheres, but uh, there is a reduction 
and the growth after 11 days has go between 30 to 40 percent. What's very similar to what we see in the brains of the fetus, depending on the stage, you know, when the infection happened. One thing that uh, was uh, on that time it was not clear is that you have the, the, the this is one uh, uh, slide showing the Zika outbreak. This is the chikungunya. This is the dengue, and then you see that like, and depending on, on, on time, you have like a lot of cases of the dengue together with increasing the cases of uh, of microcephaly here. So we decided to see if uh, there, if it was not Zika, maybe it was dengue, or maybe also our model was uh, creating some kind of uh, of uh, artifact that like if I put if I put any kind of virus, you still going to have the the, the cell there for the uh, change in the growth of the cells. So, uh, and uh, because of that, we decided to uh, play the, the same kind of approach uh, using the uh, dengue virus. And this is what we found. Basically, the dengue virus is able to infect the cells, but doesn't change the neurospheres. So basically, they are not destroyed, and also there's not uh, no, no change in the growth of the uh, organoids. But suggests that like the cause of the of the infection, only the cause of the infection of the Zika virus was these uh, changes in vitro that was not uh, uh, any specific, that was not caused by other flood virus, for example. Okay, so we proposed this model in which the nurse stem cells are infected by the Zika virus, they die, they basically disrupt the formation of the neurospheres, and they uh, impair the growth of the brain organoids. This paper was published, and then it was confirmed by other authors, which is, of course, very important nowadays when we have this uh, challenge of replicating data, right? Uh, okay, but one thing that we're interested in is that what would happen with the cells before they die? Okay, we know that like after a few days, these neurospheres are basically like, completely destroyed. But how they behave immediately after the infection? So we decided to uh, to do a different approach in which we're going to check what would happen with them without waiting for them to die. Okay, and then we decided to work with uh, human neurospheres, not only because they are fast to grow and uh, to obtain them in this kind of uh, shape, but also because you, we, we were interested in some kind of model in which we basically have all of the cells destroyed after a few uh, days, which means that like all of the cells, they are going to try to survive or try to change their, their uh, protein expression after the infection. So this helped just to, to, to show what kind of cells that we have in these nervous spheres. So basically we have uh, nervous stem cells, we have the end neurons, we have uh, radial glial cells, and uh, we uh, then decided to see, we, we were looking for one stage in which you have the infection, but the cells are not dying. Uh, so, when we, and we found that like, in, in three days, between three and six days, the cells, they are still there. There's no really change in morphology, but they are already infected. So let's see what happened with the cells after the infection, but before they, uh, they're dead. To do that, uh, again, with uh, Juliana Minardi and Daniel uh, Martins, we decided to uh, do a shotgun proteomics, basically to try to uh, cover all of the changes in, in, in gene expression and in, 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 the, in the production of proteins in these uh, organoids after the, the uh, sorry, these neurospheres uh, three days after the, the infection. It's uh, just to, to, to summarize all of the work in one slide, we uh, described four different uh, uh, programs that were changed after the, the infection. Okay, we have of course uh, proteins associated with the viral replication, as, as expected. There is a, a change in the chromosome stability in DNA damage that would then uh, stop or arrest the cell cycle, and of course is going to impair the neurogenic program. So uh, this is the model that we proposed, in which like you have uh, increase in, uh, in the uh, production of proteins associated with viral infection and DNA damage, cell cycle is uh, blocked, and then the neural differentiation is also impaired. And this paper we published more recently, and uh, in which we cover these proteins that are changed by the uh, infection. And uh, it's interesting, this paper had a very uh, interesting uh, review in Science and Traditional Medicine, in which they highlight the how it's important to use this kind of uh, models to uh, study the Zika virus. Okay, but still uh, looking at the, the, the human tissue, you can see changes in migration, so which means that like 
We have the nerve stem cells that are going to be killed, but probably also some cells that are associated with the migration of them, for example, like radioglial cells. And uh, these radioglial cells are important for the nerve stem cells or, or the cells that exit in the cell cycle to go up and form, for example, the, the cortical plate. So uh, we derived these uh, astrocytes from uh, brain organoids. This is also a recent paper from our group in collaboration with colleagues from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And then we, we show that like these uh, astrocytes, they are very uh, similar to the actual astrocytes that can be uh, uh, removed or taken from, from the brain in special surgeries. You are able to get some of these uh, human astrocytes. And when we compare this, I think, I believe that Juliana is going to show more detail about this, this tomorrow, but uh, we see that they are very similar in uh, protein expression and other markers. So with a similar kind of approach, we uh, see that like these Zika virus, they're infected, uh, they're infecting the, these astrocytes. And now we are trying to see how is the, the, the proteomics comparing astrocytes and nerves themselves, and to see if there's uh, different kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, behaves happening in these two different cell types. Okay, so now um, for the last part of my talk, I'm just going to show to you what we are seeing uh, and then try to use this kind of model to identify leads for Zika virus infection. Okay, one thing that we are looking for here was for drugs that could be uh, uh, that were already like approved by the by, by the Brazilian uh, FDA. That's called Anvisa and also that can be taken by uh, pregnant women, okay? And to do that, uh, we use it, uh, an approach that like basically combine the kind of, uh, there is a song that's what you put here, that's a nice song, but maybe it's too hard. <laughs> so here, just to show the kind of uh, uh, system that we have in the lab, we're running here, in which we combine the, uh, uh, IPS cells, nerve stem cells, nerve spheres, and uh, organoids to try to, uh, depending on the kind of assay that we do, to try to be fast and try to identify new drugs for, uh, in this case, for Zika virus, but of course we would like to do the same thing for the other kind of uh, uh, mental and neurological disorders that I started my, my talk. And uh, with this kind of approach, we uh, published a paper in collaboration with Amir Katanuri in which we showed, for example, that chlorokine can be uh, uh, useful as a, a drug for a Zika infection. And also, we uh, more recently, we showed another a paper in which we uh, used sofosbovir. This in collaboration with the Phil Cruz, with Thiago Souza, Fernando Boza, Patricia Boza, and other folks from the uh, Phil Cruz, in which we're showing that like, this is a hepatitis C drug that can be uh, useful to hit the Zika virus application and uh, we showed it in the brain organoids as well. So uh, just to, to summarize uh, the presentation, uh, we showed that like uh, collaboration with uh, Leila Schinelli and other uh, colleagues, the uh, spectrum of the neuropathological change associated with the Zika virus, but so it's not only uh, microcephaly, <coughs> there's like actually a, a huge spectrum of changes of malformations associated with the infection in vivo, in this, uh, in this fetus and in the, in the babies. Uh, using the, uh, our model uh, of organoids, we show that like it impairs the growth of neurospheres and brain organoids. We uh, basically described the molecular fingerprinting of these uh, human neurospheres after infected with the Zika virus. And uh, using this approach, we are proposing two drugs already approved by the Brazilian FDA that can also can that can be taken and in, in some cases by the uh, by pregnant women. So we, we anticipate that this could be useful if we have a, an outbreak as we had uh, last year. So just to summarize, we show this evidence of the uh, sometimes it's a bit fast, right? Yeah. So we show this evidence connecting the congenital Zika virus with the case of malformations in Brazil. Combining proteomics and the description of profile analysis, we show that like before cell death, there is DNA damage that alters the cell cycle and uh, interferes with the neurogenesis. And uh, using this kind of model, we were able to screen for uh, new drugs that can be used for uh, pregnant women. 
And uh, one more thing that's very important is that, okay, now we have uh, Zika virus, but like when you see what kind of virus can be, uh, can, can, can be hosted by the uh, Aedes aegypti, there's a huge amount of possibilities here. And besides that, we have all of these torches, syndrome infection associated like with the malformation of the brain, that we can actually can uh, work using uh, IPS cells, using uh, 2D cultures and 3D cultures as well. So what we propose here, based on the on the system that we already have running in the here at Indoor, is to is a platform that can be used to anticipate the consequence and also to uh, drug screening for a torch and other virus. And that's something that I believe that's very important and also that shows that like how IPS cells, how organoids can be useful as a, a fast and a reasonable approach to try to understand the several uh, diseases and unfortunately new diseases that can also come to, to Brazil and to other parts of the, the world. With that I, I uh, finish my talk and uh, I'd like to maybe in some interval of, the, of our meeting to show uh, the lab and to show our facility here and the other side of the, the other, in the house in front of, the, of this uh, facility we have uh, the neuroimaging facility with all of these interesting machines as well. Okay, thank you very much.